So um, <clears throat> here's the goal of the lecture. I really want you guys to understand that when you have an ankle fracture that looks like this picture on the left, you, you'd be happy with an outcome like this and not like, like this. This is, this is bad. And I want you to understand what, what went wrong in this image. Um, and so we'll kind of circle back to this at the end and talk about uh, what the problems are with this second x-ray and, uh, and what the failures were and sort of the approach to how it was fixed. So the learning objectives are to, um, I want you to have an understanding of the determinants of ankle stability, both the bony and ligamentous structures. Um, we'll talk a little bit about just normal, uh, what normal x-rays should look like um, so that you can help identify when instability is present. We'll discuss the classification systems a little bit um, and some of the common uh, fracture patterns that we see uh, in the ankle. And then we'll talk a little bit about indications for surgery and some of the fixation strategies that you can use. So um, <clears throat> should be uh, about an hour. Um, so the ankle um, is, a, is a very constrained joint. Um, we sometimes talk about bones as being kind of more osseous constraint or more ligamentous constraint. The hip would be the classic example of osseous constraint. The knee would be the classic example of ligamentous constraint. The ankle really is both. Um, there is both uh, uh, robust osseous and ligamentous, ligamentous contributions to stability. Um, the osseous constraints are the tibial plafond, which is the weight-bearing articular surface uh, of the distal tibia. Um, and then the medial and lateral malleoli form these sort of um, barriers to medial and lateral subluxation of the talus. This is kind of like a conceptual image of a way to think about how the ankle fracture, excuse me, how the ankle uh, works. So um, again, uh, the, the fibula is like this lateral strut, the medial malleolus is a medial strut, and then you have the weight-bearing articular surface on top. Um, and, and if you think about it this way, and then you, it makes it, I think, a little bit simpler to understand why these different fracture patterns can lead to um, instability. There are also ligaments that contribute to it. Um, so there's a, there's sort of a lateral ligamentous complex of the, the ATFL and the CFL and the PTFL. There's a medial ligamentous complex. It's the superficial and deep deltoid ligaments. And then there are syndesmotic uh, ligaments that hold the two bones together. And so these work in concert with the bony constraints to keep the talus more or less centered under the tibia. So if we kind of come back to that same a uh, little conceptual diagram of how your ankle works. Um, this is kind of how you can think of it. And so um, <clears throat> the ligament and the bone works together. So if the talus tries to shift laterally towards the fibula, the fibula is going to stop that. And so is the deltoid ligament on the medial side. It's going to act like a tether. In contrast, if you try to shift the talus to the medial side, the medial malleolus is going to block that. And the fibula with the lateral ligaments, the lateral ligaments are going to be like a rope kind of hold, tethering the talus there. And that's kind of how it works. There's almost, there's always kind of a, when the talus shifts in an ankle fracture, there's usually a side that sort of fails in compression and a side that fails in tension. So just a really important concept as you're thinking about <clears throat> how these fail and then how you're going to try to fix it. All right. So now um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the normal radiographic anatomy, because if you understand what normal x-rays look like, then you can recognize uh, abnormal and recognize when there might be instability present. So um, this first x-ray, this is a, an AP um, x-ray of the ankle. So an AP x-ray is just with the, the foot pointing straight forward. And when you do it that way, the, the tibia and the fibula overlap um, because you're not really shooting in line with the joint. The joint's a little bit externally rotated. And so on this AP view, what you see um, is there will be this uh, uh, overlap between the tibia and the fibula, and you can measure that overlap in two different ways. You can either look at the, this little clear space, which I've marked with number one here, um, which is actually the incisura between the fibula and the tibia, or you can actually look at the overlap, the degree of overlap between the two bones. And the reason why this is useful is when you're trying to look at syndesmotic injury, if there's either widening of the clear space or decrease in the overlap, 
kind of work opposite. If you have, again, increase in the, in the clear space or decrease in the overlap, then uh, that's an indication that you may have a syndesmotic injury. I'll say that a much more important view to me is this one, which is the mortise view. Um, and the mortise view is more useful to me because um, it's more of a true AP of the joint itself. So because the ankle joint is externally rotated uh, relative to your foot, if you internally rotate the leg and then shoot the image, you get this much clearer view of the ankle joint. You can see you're basically sort of looking right down the, right down the, the that upside down U shape uh, of, the, of the ankle joint and the joint space becomes much more clear. And so this is probably the most, if you were gonna like have one single view that you were gonna use to sort of understand some of these concepts that I'm talking about in terms of stability, this would probably be the most important one. Kind of matches up with that uh, upside down, that uh, uh, conceptual framework that I was talking about with the fibula and the metamalleolus. And what you're looking for on this um, is the, the sort of symmetry of the joint space and the medial clear space. So the medial clear space is over here between the medial malleolus and the, and the medial talus, the medial shoulder. Um, <clears throat> and you can measure that distance. Um, you know, it's often said that, that four or less is sort of normal. It, it turns out there's a lot of variability in this, but, um, and that's why I personally just prefer to look at joint space symmetry. Typically, it's very symmetric with the superior joint space and the lateral joint space. So I think that's a nice uh, uh, sort of qualitative way of understanding whether the medial clear space is wide or not. But what you're looking at here is if the medial clear space is wide, that's an indicator that the deltoid ligament uh, might, be, might be injured. Another parameter that we is really important to, to look at and understand when you're um, both preoperatively and intraoperatively looking at ankle fractures is fibular length because one of our goals in surgery is to restore fibular length. There are several different parameters that we can look at um, to judge fibular length. Um, one is uh, called the dime sign, um, which is uh, shown here in this, this diagram. It's basically um, this sort of continuity between the distal end of the fibula and the lateral process of the talus. Um, you can see here in the second image, the fibula has, is shortened and there's a lack of continuity between those two. I think it's a little bit of a, a harder one to, to see sometimes. This is what it looks like on a real, on a real patient who's had surgery at the end of the case. So you can see the little dime sign down here, but it is, uh, one clue that you can use to help understand whether your fibula is at length. Uh, another one, which I actually think this is probably the most useful and the one that I use the most often is to, is called the, called the Shenton's line. It's again, it's sort of a line that's in continuity between the fibula and the tibia. See where those two little arrows are. They, there should be, um, a smooth line there and there's, there's a little beak kind of between the fibula and the, uh, at the corner of the fibula that you can make sure lines up. So you see in the bottom right image, those are no longer in continuity because that little beak is a little bit higher up. Um, so that's another um, clue that the fibula is not, not out of length. And then the last one is, is the talocrural angle, which is the angle between the joint surface and then a line drawn between the medial malleolus and the fibula. And because the fibula is generally longer than the medial malleolus, this angle turns out to be about 83 degrees. Um, if your fibula and your medial malleolus are at the same level, which would give you an angle of, you know, essentially zero, you, you, excuse me, 90 degrees, I guess, by the way it's measured, uh, you would basically, you would definitely be short in that case. So you basically your fibula should be longer than your medial malleolus. So that's the, that's the things you can look at on the mortise. On the lateral x-ray, um, there's a couple things. I think the single most important um, for you to understand is our, the, the articular surface is congruent. So what I mean by that is that the subchondral line of the tibia, distal tibia articular surface, is parallel with the subchondral line of the talus. So I've drawn that there. So if those line, if the talus is shifted anterior, posterior, those two lines will not be, um, will not be parallel. And that added means it's, there's a, a subluxation or a dislocation of the ankle joint, which is when you guys are in the ER in the future and you're reducing ankle fractures, you're 
kind of make want to make sure that you've restored uh, that that uh, this relationship. Um, the other thing that we can look at, and this relates to the syndesmosis, is the um, is the amount of fibular translation or the amount of it's sort of the amount of distal tibia that's sticking out behind the fibula. Uh, it's very similar to on the AP view, how we were looking at the overlap between the tibia and the fibula. There's also a normal amount of overlap on the lateral. And we can use that if you're trying to fix the syndesmotic injury and trying to understand the relationship. Not only do they have do the fibula and tibia have to go together, they also have to be translated correctly. So this is one way that you can um, assess that. And then last but not least, sometimes it's just really hard to tell and there's a lot of variability from patient to patient. And so um, taking a contralateral image um, can be really, really helpful, especially for more complex patterns. And so uh, by looking at the contralateral side, you can assess um, all the different parameters I just said on the other side and make sure you're matching them exactly. Instead of using some you know, population average number, you can actually just make sure it matches the other side. So this is a really useful tool. So I'm gonna pause there for a second. I feel like it's kind of, we're moving fast so far. Does anyone have any questions so far about sort of the anatomy of the ankle joint and how it makes it stable or how we assess radiographs? Okay, I don't hear any comments so far, so we'll just keep on trucking. Um, <clears throat> the next thing to talk about, um, so we talked about normal anatomy, now we're gonna talk about abnormal anatomy or fractures. Um, so we're gonna um, go through the, the Weber classification. There's two main classification systems that are used for ankle fractures, the Weber classification and the um, uh, Loggy Hansen classification system. I think the Weber is a little bit simpler and easier, especially when you're learning to understand. But it basically uh, looks at the level of the fibula fracture relative to the um, syndesmosis. And so uh, a Weber A um, is below the level of the syndesmosis, a Weber B is at the level of the syndesmosis, and a Weber C is above. And what I think is a really important concept is to understand what what motion or what movement of the talus generates the, these patterns. So a Weber A fracture uh, happens because the talus is actually moving medially and the um, fibula is actually failing in tension. So it's like a, it's a pull off. We often say it's like a glorified ankle sprain because it really is just uh, the, those lateral ligaments, the ATFL, the CFL, and the PTFL are just pulling off like a rope, just pulling off their anchor point of the distal fibula. Um, <clears throat> and then it pushes and breaks the medial malleolus and the medial malleolus fails in compression. So it generates a little bit more complex pattern. That's the only one that is that way. For uh, all other ankle fractures, the, the fibula, it's, the talus is going laterally. So for a Weber B and a Weber C, the talus is going towards the fibula, pushing on the fibula and causing the fibula to break. And then the medial malleolus is the what's failing in tension. Same for the Weber C, the talus is pushing on the fibula and causing the fibula to break. And then the, what's different in this, what, what separates a C from a B is that because the fracture exits so much higher, you can think about it. If I'm pushing on the fibula down here, there's no way, there's no way I could break the fibula that high up without tearing all the syndesmotic ligaments as well. So that's the key take home for why a C matters versus a B is that a Weber C fracture will always involve a syndesmotic injury in addition to um, the other bone and ligamentous injuries that you see. So, um, so this, um, Again, is the talus is going laterally, breaks the fibula, and then the medium malleolus fails in tension. So this is kind of a key concept of understanding which side failed in compression, which side failed in tension. Weber A is the only one where the fibula fails in tension. Uh, and Weber B and Weber C, it's the medial malleolus that fails in tension. And so that's really important when we think about how we actually want to fix, uh, fix these fractures. It's also relevant if you're in the ER and you're trying to figure out how to reduce an ankle fracture, you want to understand which way you want to push, right? Because if you're 
if you're reducing uh, a Weber B or C, then there's something called the Quigley maneuver where you push the talus medially and that's gonna work really well. If you're doing a Weber A fracture with, a, with this medium layless and you push the talus medially, you're actually gonna make it worse. So just something to remember. So the Loggy Hansen classification, I'm not gonna go in a ton of detail on Loggy Hansen. It's a little bit of, um, I actually really like, a lot of people hate Loggy Hansen. I think it's actually really interesting. If you understand Loggy Hansen at a really deep level, you're gonna really have a high level understanding of ankle fractures. So I encourage you to, to read about it and, and dig into understanding it in more depth. But um, <clears throat> the bottom line is where it came from is there were some surgeons that took cadavers and they positioned the foot in a certain way and then they applied a force. And that's where the names of the Loggy Hansen comes from. Um, it's the position of the foot and then the force that was applied. And then they found that they could reproduce a lot of common ankle fracture patterns by doing that. So the common positions and forces applied were, are these four. So supination and the way, you know, means the foot's sort of uh, uh, turned inward and then it's externally rotating as the force applied. That is what generates the supination external rotation injury or SER. Um, pronation injuries are turned outward and then you can, you can see the forces that are applied for the different ones. Um, so the supination external rotation is the most common. It's about 90% of injuries. Um, and so you'll want to remember that for sure. Um, and what I, a nice way to just think about it is they, they do relate to one another. So you can, you can kind of map the Loggy Hansen classification onto the Weber classification which makes it maybe a little bit easier as a starting point for Loggy Hansen. Um, so the Weber A fracture is a supination adduction injury. A Weber B is a supination external rotation. Remember that's the most common, that's 90% of ankle fractures. So the vast majority that we see and treat are Weber B supination external rotation injuries. And then the Weber C fractures are the pronation injuries. So just remember the Weber C goes with the ones that start with the letter P. So all the, if you have a pronation injury, it means you have this high fibula fracture. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an easy way to remember it. The other thing on the Weber A, remember the Weber A is the only one where the talus goes medially. If you think about what adduction, adduction means it's going medially. All the other forces, the external rotation and the abduction that you see on the, on the other three, uh, the talus is going laterally. So again, you just kind of relating those, those concepts together. Just some clinical examples, some x-rays showing uh, these different types of injuries. Um, this, is the, this is a Weber A uh, or supination adduction type injury. Um, again, it's, it's, this, it's kind of the exception um, in terms of the direction that the talus is going. Um, we, we put, put the little sad face up there. We call it the sad injury because this is an injury where, um, there's often damage to the weight bearing, uh, part portion of the, of the distal tibia, right in that corner, there's often some impaction of the joint surface. And so one thing that we didn't really talk about is what separates an ankle fracture from a pilon fracture. We're not talking about pilon fractures in this talk, but pilon fractures are when there's axial loading that causes damage to that weight bearing horizontal portion of the articular surface. Um, <clears throat> this injury, these SAD injuries are kind of on that spectrum because they begin to injure the weight bearing articular surface. So I just, you know, the more articular damage there is, the more risk of arthritis and problems down the road. So these have a worse prognosis than the other ankle fractures, uh, which is why why we say they're sad. Um, ankle fractures and contrast appeal on fractures are really just, they're just a, a shifting of the talus that causes this compression failure and this tension failure of the, of the medial or lateral constraints of the ankle, but no damage to the articular surface. So I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, anyway, so this one kind of enters into that pilon spectrum. So it's a, it's a much worse injury. Uh, Weber B, again, this is the bread and butter. This is the one that you'll see over and over again in, uh, in the ER and in clinic. Um, it has a very predictable pattern to it where it um, sort of, it starts at the, uh, it starts at the joint 
anteriorly and, and sort of anterior and medial aspect of the fibula, and then it exits out proximally posterior and lateral. And you can see that on both the this mortis and the lateral x-ray, sort of the orientation. I tried to outline it for you there, but um, so it kind of always goes in that orientation. So it starts at the joint, exits uh, sort of proximal posterior lateral. Um, very, very common pattern. And then the million dollar question with Weber B's is whether you have injury to the injury to the medial side. So we'll get into that in a little bit about how you can assess for that. The Weber C injury, um, again, is this high fibula fracture. So when we see that, we know the syndesmosis is there. We know that it has to be torn. There's no way, there's no way that talus can shift and push that fibula and break it that high up without tearing all the ligaments in between the fracture and the distal fibula. So it's, it's always a syndesmosis injury when you have a Weber C. Dr. Dr. Shearer? Yeah. I'm having uh, trouble visualizing the the supination and external rotation. I, I don't know if you could just like maybe demonstrate it with your hand or something, that injury pattern. The pattern or like the position of the foot that how that how that works. Yeah, the mechanism of injury. So the supination implies the position of the foot. So it's turn means turn inward and then external rotations mean it's rotating out. Um, the I think it's not as important to think about it. So it's actually, it's a whole, um, it's an interesting thing actually about do those, do those positions and, and directions of force actually occur in, in real life. So it was done. This was, remember this was done in a cadaver lab. This was like a study that they did where they reproduced these, these patterns. There's actually an interesting study where somebody found a bunch of YouTube videos of, of like skateboarders breaking their ankles. And then, then they had the x-rays also. And it turns out that most of the injuries uh, were pronation type injuries. There weren't, even the, even the SERs were happening in pronation. So you, the bottom line is you can't really, um, you can't really use like the position of the foot and the direction of force in clinical practice to predict ankle fracture patterns. But I do think that there is a utility in understanding it still because the, the patterns still are reproducible. So in other words, we do see the, the patterns that they created in that study are the ones that we commonly see in clinical practice. Um, the way I actually think about it, or the way I, I find Loggy Hansen useful is if you think about the position of the foot, supination or pronation, one side is intention and one side's not. So supination, the lateral side of the ankle is under tension and the medial side is not. So those injuries, the, the tension side is where the injury starts. So if you read, I don't know if you guys have read about Loggy Hansen, but it goes through stages. So you go stage one, two, three, four, for example, for an SCR. That pattern starts in the side that's under tension. So in a supination injury, it starts on the lateral side and progresses from lateral to medial. So the last thing to tear in an SCR injury is the medial side, either the, either the deltoid or the medial malleolus breaks. That's why you can have an injury where you have a fibula fracture, but you don't have medial sided instability because the medial sided instability happens last. In other words, an SCR two versus an SCR four. With pronation injuries, it's the opposite. So now the foot's turned outward, the medial side is under tension. So the medial side is where the injury starts. So why is that relevant? If you have a high fibula fracture, so it's a pronation injury, the injury started on the medial side and progressed laterally. And if you see the fibula fracture, you know that the deltoid ligament has to be torn too because it started on the medial side and went lateral. So even if the deltoid's not, even if the medial malleolus is not broken, you know that you have an unstable injury because it started on the medial side and went laterally. Anyway, that was a bit of a digression on Loggy Hansen. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. No, that helped. Ba basically, what you're saying is it was um, those positions are used strictly to reproduce, like in the research setting. But then in real life, you might be able to get this Weber B with pronation, is kind of what I understood. And then the injury always kind of starts um, on the side where there's tension on the ligaments. Perfectly stated. Exactly. 
So the pronation, pronation, the medial side's under tension, supination, the lateral side's under tension. So if you go through all these diagrams, and I didn't put it in here just because I think it's a lot, a heavy dose of, <laughs> of classification, but if you look through the textbooks or online or whatever and look through the Loggy Hansen classification, you look through the stages, you'll, you'll find that it always starts on the tension side and progresses. It's just kind of a, a, I'm like not a memorizing person. I have to think about things conceptually and that's just a conceptual way of kind of remembering how it works. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So you can, in other words, if you're in the ER and a patient comes in, you, you wouldn't ask them, so what position was your foot in and how, to, which way did it turn? It's not going to help you, you know, diagnose the fracture, but you can still look at the x-rays and understand and still put them into these buckets. And, that, and it is, I think, useful to understand what those buckets are. All right. Very good. Good. Great question. A source of great confusion for many orthopedic trainees over the years is these classification systems. Um, so <clears throat> those are the different patterns in the classification system. So when, when do we need to fix it? So um, basically, uh, we want to fix it if you have uh, an unstable ankle joint. And, and an easy way to remember that is if you have disruption of two or more of the bony or ligamentous constraints. So the easy one is if it's bone, if it's the bone that breaks. So if the bone breaks, you have a bimalleolar or trimalleolar fracture, that's basically always unstable and we're generally, generally gonna recommend surgery for those patients. So, you know, the talus shifts laterally, it breaks the fibula, and then you get an avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus. That's your classic bimalleolar injury. That's gonna be unstable. That's the really obvious one if it's all fracture. What's a little bit more complicated is if you have a situation where it's, um, you don't have a medial malleolus fracture, it can be less obvious sometimes. This x-ray that I'm showing here, it's very clear that the medial clear space is wide. So you know the deltoid ligament is injured, but it's not always that obvious. So if you have, again, the tail is shifting laterally, you re it's really all about the deltoid. You can also have the deltoid fail and that, you know, you lose that tether and now you again have uh, instability. I'm really proud of this animation, by the way. This took me a little while, look at that. <laughs> anyway, so the, that, that's kind of the, again, why that concept is important. You wanna understand if there's two or more uh, bone or ligamentous injuries dis disrupted, that's when you have instability. That's generally gonna be your surgical indication. So why does the shift matter? Um, well, it turns out that if you shift the talus over just one millimeter, you get like an almost 50% increase, uh, excuse me, almost 50% decrease in the contact uh, area between the, ta uh, the talus and the tibial profond. And it just has to do with the dome shape of the talus. You get a significant increase and that leads to arthritis and stiffness and pain down the road. So our goal is really to um, anatomically uh, uh, get the talus so there's zero shift um, and normal that normal anatomic relationship uh, between the two bones to minimize the risk of, of arthritis and those type of problems. So this is kind of what I've been referring to. It's not always obvious. So here's the same x-ray that I was showing you. Um, we can see that the fibula is broken. It's a Weber B ankle fracture. So we know we have at least one bony or ligaments to structure this injured, but we don't know about the medial side. And this is where we get something called occult instability. So this looks benign. It looks like just a fibula fracture. So let's treat it non-operatively, but we don't really know if the deltoid is injured because um, we can't see it on an x-ray. So how do we deal with that? Well, you can do a stress examination. In this case, it was a gravity stress examination where the patient lies on their side and just the weight of the foot stresses that deltoid ligament. And now very clearly, um, we see that this is an unstable injury. We know that, again, looking at the medial clear space versus the superior clear space, it's very obviously grossly widened. Um, so we know that we have an unstable injury and this patient's indicated for surgery. There are multiple different ways to stress. There are multiple different studies that try to compare these different methods of doing, doing the stress um, <clears throat> and I, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer, but there are pros and cons of the different options. I think for you guys, it's just important to understand 
the when you should do a stress exam and uh, and the importance of it. Um, so these are the three main options that people do. The manual stress exam on the left there is um, with usually with a mini fluoroscopy machine, or you can use a regular X-ray. But I usually do it with the mini fluoro, and you're just manually with with your own hands. You're holding holding with one hand, stabilizing the tibia and externally rotating the foot and seeing if you have any widening. The middle one is the gravity stress exam, which is what I was describing, where you have the patient um, sort of lie on their side with the foot hanging over the end of the bed and just the weight of the foot is applying the stress. And then the third option, which is kind of increasing in popularity, is to do a weight-bearing uh, x-ray. Um, so it's literally just having the patient stand with their own body weight and taking a, a mortise x-ray. Um, the advantage of that is that it's a, it's a physiologic, excuse me, a physiologic um, stress. Uh, it also, one of the challenges with all these stress examinations is that if the foot is very plantar flexed, it turns out that the talus is a little bit bigger in the front than in the back. So if you're really plantar flexed, you can get asymmetry of the mortise. You can get sort of it looks like medial clear space widening when it's just the normal shape of the person's talus. So the foot, it's much better to assess medial clear space widening with the foot in a neutral position. And you can do that with the manual stress exam and you can do it with the weight bearing stress exam, but with the gravity stress exam, it's a little bit more difficult because the patient's foot's just hanging free. So personally, my preference is to do a manual stress exam where I can control it at everything or a weight bearing stress exam. Downside of the weight bearing stress exam is obviously ankle fractures hurt and patients don't necessarily want to put a lot of weight on it. And so it can be a little bit difficult, um, especially in an ER setting. But key message is just make sure you do something to evaluate that the medial side of the injury if you're not sure if it's injured or not. <clears throat> this is obvious, this is a bad fracture dislocation, no doubt whether this is uh, unstable or not. This is um, one that's gonna need surgery. Um, but when you fix it, you're not necessarily done. This looks pretty good. The mortise looks reduced. Our medial clear space is, is symmetric with the other joint spaces again. But we didn't evaluate the syndesmosis. So uh, at the end of a surgery on, on these fractures, you have to test the syndesmosis and see if it's unstable. And this is what it looks like on the stress exam. And what you can see is you don't have any of that tibiofibular overlap anymore. You also have widening of the medial clear space. So this is an indicator of syndesmotic instability. And so you have to fix that with uh, some, for, some form of um, syndesmotic fixation. I have a quick question about clear space, like the exact. Yeah. Because sometimes it, I feel like you're referring to the joint space and sometimes it's the overlap of the bones. Is there like a strict definition? Yeah. So um, let me go back to that picture. I think we'll show the best. Okay, um, so it's it's this one right here. So I'm gonna do a little annotation on here because it might help. So this is the I'm gonna outline. So this is fibula. Are you guys seeing this? Mm -hmm. You're on. So I love Zoom. I do a lot of Zoom teaching now. It's kind of fun. Okay, so so that's the fibula. This right here that I'm outlining is the tibia. Mm -hmm. And then there's another line that's kind of faint right here, which this is like the, this is kind of the opposite side of the incisura. So you can measure, you can measure, I'm like running out of colors here, but you can measure it either way. So clear space would refer to measuring this distance right here between the fibula and the, and the um, sort of incisura of the tibia the overlap would refer to this distance right here, between the, the overlap between the tibia and the fibula. You can use, um, you can use either one. They're like, I, I use both, um, but they're, they're like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're like the, as the clear space gets bigger, the overlap gets smaller. You know what I mean? They're like directly related to one another. So as I, if I, um, 
this right there. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the reason I can't see it. Shoot. My mouse disappeared on me. Well, um, never had that happen before. We got a, my, my mouse kind of disappeared on me. The bottom line is um, you can use either one. Um, I use both. You want to look at all the information that's available. Um, but the overlap is it looks, it looks different on an AP than on a lateral. I mean, excuse me, on a mortise. So on an AP, you have uh, a lot of overlap between the tibia and fibula. And on the mortise, you have just a tiny bit of overlap. Some people have no overlap. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but you really want to, you can use both, both parameters and they're related to one another, but they're not the same. Okay. I, I see it with the, the overlap, but when you, on the last slide, you said that the medial clear space was widened and I thought you were pointing to like the joint space. I guess, could you point that one out? Yeah. I mean, if I can figure out how to get my mouse to reappear here, let me see. Okay, we're back in back in business. Okay, so let me flip back to where we were. So it's a good question. These terms get like kind of thrown around a lot. It's not always clear. So where were we? We were on this one. Okay, so. Here is where you have the overlap and uh, tibiofibular um, clear space. Over here, this other one is where you have the medial clear space. So I can get the little, hopefully I don't lose my cursor again, but basically here's the, here's the one side of the, the sort of most medial side of the incisor at the deepest point. Here's like, the lateral most point of the tibia. So the overlap would be like the distance between those two, there's no overlap. And the clear space would be the distance between these two, which is also increased. But that's a different, that's one set of terminology. When I was saying the medial clear space is widening, I was talking about over here. Yeah, that's what I was confused about because I thought if clear space was defined by overlap of the bones, then I didn't want to mix that up with like joint space. Right. No, clear space and overlap are different. Um, clear space overlap is overlap is like if you look over here, the fibula and the tibia are overlapping one another. That's overlap. Um, clear space is it's the op basically the opposite of overlap. But then clear space over there on the medial side in a normal x-ray i don't really see i guess i just don't understand <laughs> the medial side it just seems like a joint space i don't really know where the clear space if it's being defined as a section of the bone that looks clear which i'm just uh, feeling I, I think i'm starting to understand the what the problem is <laughs> okay. it, there's so there's so there's there's always a clear space the joint yeah. is a clear space there's always clear space where your joint is yeah when we say medial clear space widening we're just saying the space is getting bigger it's not like it exists and then doesn't exist it's just clear and then it widens so it's really medial clear space widening is the terminology mm -hmm. So that, that's all it really is. But it, is that, that, the medial clear space widening, I just want to say, like, if I'm trying to describe a radiograph, that that is referring to the joint space, not a section of the bone that's more translucent. Correct. That's confusing because <laughs> the other um, clear space that's between the tibia and the fibula is defined as a more, tr like, radiolucent part <laughs> of the tibia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see, your, I see the, I see how it's, yeah, I see how it's confusing. Um, That's okay. There's yeah. always things in medicine. Yeah, you can, somebody can come up with better words for it. But I think that, 
Uh, I think the more important thing is just to understand the concepts of yeah, I un- what, I what you're getting at. You did a very good job of explaining. Thank you. I just okay. will know no, now. No worries. <laughs> I have a, a disappearing mouse again. I don't know why that keeps happening. Okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of like instability, how to look at normal x-rays. I think we've gotten through most of that stuff. Any other questions? We're going to talk a little bit about kind of the last thing is going to just be talking a little bit about how we actually fix it uh, in a lot of depth, but we'll go broad strokes. I did, I did actually have a question about yeah. either fluoroscopy or radiographs, like official radiographs, if the angle um, changes any of these um, radiographic angles that we're looking at, the angle of the fl- fluoroscopy. Yeah, the angle in terms of, um, so like the telocrural angle, if that changes with how the radiograph is angled. Yeah, if you wrote, if you change the rotation, um, it is going to change the telocrural angle. Um, so most of those are defined on the mortise view, which means there's only one, there's only one rotation where you're going to get a mortise. Um, and so that's when you should be judging telocrural angle. Um, but you're right, if if you looked at an AP x-ray where the foot is rotated differently than a mortise, an AP and a telocurl angle because the, the medium layers and the fibula are going to be a little bit closer together on that projection. And so it's going to make the telocurl angle look bigger. So you want to make sure you're judging it uh, consistently on the mortise x-ray. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, perfect. Great questions. Let's see here. Okay, fixation strategies. So, um, to fix the fibula, there are two. There's two really common ways you'll see people do it. Um, one is with a lag screw and neutralization plate. The other is with what's called an anti glide or buttress plate. Um, what I'm showing here is the lag screw and neutralization plate. Um, a lag screw, and it's hard without going into all the you know, principles of fixation, but um, a lag screw is a screw that generates compression across the fracture site and it crosses the fracture. So it's usually placed first, and then the plate is placed in neutralization mode to kind of neutralize the forces across that screw. A screw all by itself, it's really good at generating compression, but you can imagine the fracture can twist and rotate around it. So the plate neutralizes the forces across the lag screw. So that's probably the most common way you'll see a Weber B fibula fracture get fixed. Um, This is kind of what it looks like. This one actually got two lag screws. I personally don't do this technique very much. So this is someone else's case, but they use two lag screws and then, um, and then place the plate to neutralize the forces across that. The other method, this is just personally, this is the one that I prefer to do, but um, both work fine, um, is an anti-glide or buttress plate. So in this method, the, the plate goes posteriorly over the fibula and it goes first, and you place the first screw, if you look at the top image there, the first screw right over the fracture apex, um, kind of captures the corner of that fracture and really compresses that down. And then the, the plate just acts like a little thumb kind of pushing the distal fragment where it belongs. And then you can apply a lag screw through it. If you look at the bottom image, there's a lag screw that you can actually place through the plate um, at the bottom. There are some biomechanical advantages to putting the plate in this position compared to in a lateral position. Um, but I think for most fractures, both techniques uh, work well and it's really just kind of surgeon choice. But the sequence is different for the two, so you just want to understand how the, the difference in sequence. Are both of these plates locking screws? No. No? Okay. In fact, yeah, they're really simple little plates. Um, they're called third tubular plates. Um, they're called that because it's like you took a tube and you just cut it into thirds. They're like so pretty flimsy, you could bend them in your hands. Um, and the screws are, are non-locking screws. Um, you don't, the, you know, the amount of force on the fibula is not, not that much. So you don't need 
um, to use locking plates. Now there are situations where you do use locking locking plates um, on fibular fractures when you have um, you know more complex comminuted patterns and you're doing a bridging technique. It's a really short low fracture, so short segment fixation, or the patient's really osteoporotic. Those are the three main indications for a locking fixation. Um, then you can do it. But I would say for the majority of, you know, low energy fibula fractures, um, these simple, cheap plates are, are more than adequate. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Scherer? Yeah. Can I ask one more funny question? Of course, I these questions are great. Um, so <laughs> you can I just wanted to confirm that the lag screw um, is being called based on what it's doing, regardless of whether it's in the plate or or the plate is in a, a adjunct to it, right? Yes, um, that's exactly right. I um, so the the lag screw, what it is, um, I didn't really go into it. I, I should have I should have probably gotten a little background about it. But basically, what it is, uh, there's two ways to do it. One is you can do a partially threaded screw. Um, or you can do what's called over drilling or lag by technique, which is what's done here. So what's been done here is the this first portion has been drilled to be bigger than the actual thread. So basically the, the screw just slides through that first portion. And then in the more um, in the more distal portion of the screw, it's that's the only part that's capturing. And so what that does, so it's an interfragmentary screw, meaning it crosses the fracture, and it only has really purchase on one side. So it glide, we call it the glide hole on one side, and then the other side is actually getting purchase. And what that does is as you tighten it down, it's like it's just going to pull the other fragment towards it and generate compression. So it's a, a method of creating compression across the fracture site, which fractures love compression. So it's something we always, always like. Um, so that's what kind of defines a lag screw. It's an interfragmentary screw that generates compression across the fracture site, either by technique, by over drilling, or by design, by using a partially threaded screw. But it can be done through a plate or as an independent lag screw either way. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. No worries. Uh, Here's just an example of the more buttress style plate. In this one, the this third the third screw from the bottom, that's the lag screw that's going interfragmentary. But in, instead of going anterior to posterior, it goes posterior to anterior. Um, the last sort of fibula fixation strategy when you have a really comminuted fracture is bridge plating. Um, is what I'm showing here. So um, it's a sort of a different concept. You're not trying to line up every little piece of bone. You're just trying to get the length rotation and alignment of that distal fibula and, and then securing it in place and spanning across the fracture. Um, and so it's a little bit more of a challenging technique because you're not get you know, you don't, it's harder to judge the reduction. We often use contralateral imaging and things like that to make sure that it's lined up. But it, it, sometimes if it's in just too many pieces, um, this is a, a more effective way of treating the fracture. For um, the medial malleolus, nine, you know, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be treated with uh, a couple of lag screws, uh, like what's shown here. Again, lag screws are these interfragmentary compression screws. Two screws, is, this is what you'll see on most x-rays. And remember, it's because it's a, you know, this tension, it's a fairly simple tension failure. So you don't need this big, you know, big plate to hold onto it. You just need something to kind of hold it in position as long as you've stabilized the fibula. The exception to the rule is the is the is the fracture pattern that was the exception. So if you remember that supination adduction injury, uh, Weber A type fracture where the talus went medially, and that's it. That's the one situation where you can kind of flip your fixation around. So you can put the buttress plate on the medial side to buttress the talus from going medially. And then you can use a little bit lighter fixation on the fibula. In this case, it was a, a intermedullary screw that was done. So um, most of the time when the medial malleolus fails in tension, um, you can do the um, 
you can do the lag screws. But if you have this situation, this this relatively rare situation, but when it does happen that the tailless goes the other direction and the medium allowance fails in compression, you want to fix it with a plate. Uh, poster malleolus fractures, I'm not going to go in too much depth. It's, you could almost do a whole other talk on that. Um, I'll just say that there's, you can either try to fix it with screws going from, going from front to back, or you can go from the back and do a big buttress plate. The fixation, when you go directly from the back and fix it from the back, is much better. So I think that's generally the preferred thing. So we're going to remember one thing to fix poster malleolus fractures. It should be uh, buttress plating. So applying a plate directly on the poster malleolus fracture. Synosmotic screws, man, there's so there's again a whole easily another hour just to talk about the synosmosis. So I'm not going to go into it. Just remember that you have to identify those injuries. So remember all Weber C injuries have a have a synosmotic injury. And then some Weber B injuries will have a synosmotic injury. Those are the ones that you have to test at the end of surgery. So just make sure you're looking and, and don't forget about the synosmosis. And if you see instability, then treat it. So come back to this image. This was kind of our goal is to understand what went wrong on this, this image. So um, what do you guys think? What went wrong here? What's abnormal about this x-ray? I think the Shinsen's line uh, isn't smooth. Yeah, for sure. I mean, almost all the radiographic parameters we talked about are abnormal. The fibula is short. Because like you said, the Shenton's line is disrupted, the dime sign is disrupted, the Taylor pearl angle is backwards, right? Because the fibula is shorter than the medial malleolus. Um, so we have bad fibular shortening. Uh, our medial clear space is opened up. Um, sort of a lot of, lot, of, lot of bad things happening in terms of where the talus is, not where it's supposed to be. And why do you think, what do you think about the, what do you guys think about the choice of fixation for the fibula? Which way was the talus trying to go when this thing broke, medial or lateral? Lateral. Lateral, right? So putting a smooth wire up the fibula doesn't really make a ton of sense in that situation, right? You need something that's some kind of solid, either the sort of lag screw neutralization plate or the buttress plate, something that's gonna really rigidly fix the compression failure side, whatever side, fails under compression, that, that's the side that needs more rigid fixation. Um, and then I don't know what went wrong on the medial side over there. They did try to do a tension band thing and um, looks like the deltoid is torn. So, you know, a lot went wrong in this image. So hopefully now that makes a little bit more sense about um, why the fixation strategy wasn't quite right on this one. So just some take home points, just, um, you know, understand that the ankle is a highly constrained joint and understand that what, how the, both the bony, the medial and lateral malleolus and the ligamentous structures contribute to the stability. Remember that if you disrupt two of those, then you're going to get instability and instability is the reason why we fix these. Know kind of which side failed in tension and which side failed in compression. It'll serve you well when you're in the ER trying to reduce these. It'll serve you in the future when you're fixing them. If you kind of understand how the fracture failed. And then you can apply your fixation based on that mechanism of failure and in the pattern of the, of the fracture. That's all I got. Uh, Dr. In, Shear, so yeah. what, how, how do these patients do long-term in terms of like their range of motion and their function on the side that you fix? Yeah, great question. So long-term outcome of ankle fractures, well, it, it depends on the, um, which pattern of injury. The sort of bread and butter Weber B ankle fracture patients do very well. And, most um, have good outcomes as long as you follow the principles and, and restore the stability of their ankle joint. So again, remember, if you have one millimeter of shift, then they're going to do poorly. But generally, if you follow the, do things right, you reduce the fibula correctly and fix it rigidly, um, then they have actually a really, really pretty good outcome. Um, I let them start weight bearing at two weeks. They're usually um, off crutches by six weeks um, and sort of getting back to more aggressive activities by three or four months. Um, and they have a, you know, their joint generally does okay. Now there are exceptions. There are patients with like the supination adduction injury, the SAD injury, 
where it like there's damage to the weight bearing articular surface um, and it starts to look more like a pilon fracture, they have higher risk of developing post-traumatic arthritis and things like that. So there are definitely exceptions, um, but by and large, um, they do pretty well. Any other questions before we wrap up? I have a question. When you do the syndesmotic um, screw, do you usually just leave that in or do you, do you take that out? Um, yeah, that's a good question. There's, there's, there's so many controversies on, on syndesmotic fixation, so I didn't, didn't go there. But I think um, that's one of them is whether to take it out or not. My philosophy um, is, is to listen to the patient. So um, I, I put the screws in and then I talk to him about it. I tell him that it's, if we leave it in, it's probably going to either loosen or break. Um, but it turns out there's been studies and if you loosen or break, most people actually feel better because they sort of get the motion back. Um, sort of counterintuitive because most people think, oh, I've broken hardware. I have to like take it out. But in fact, just by breaking, there's some of that motion coming back. And I think those are the patients who really don't benefit necessarily from taking it out. So I talk to people about it, usually around the three month mark, I sort of explain that, you know, this is probably going to loosen or break. Um, we can take it out, which means you get a hundred percent chance of surgery, or we can wait and see. And around six months, if you're still having symptoms, we can do it if you want it. And what I've found that is the majority of people end up just leaving it in because it sort of either loosens or breaks and the symptoms get better. But it's an area of controversy. There's some people that take them out every single time. So it kind of depends, depends who you ask. There's also a whole thing with flexible fixation, like the tightrope. That's a whole other area. I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting things with syndesmosis that, but that's a good, good question. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. I'll um, go ahead, Dr. Sure. I was just going to say, feel free to email me or whatever if you have any questions about anything that was talked about in this talk. Um, it's just my first last name, David Dashier at ecsf.edu. So feel free to reach out um, if any questions come up. Thanks, Dr. Shear. Appreciate you, especially subbing in this week on short uh, no problem. My pleasure. All right. Take care, guys. You too, Dr. Shear. Um, I'll stick around for any questions, anyone too.